Hello, welcome back to the Oddshoria Pigments 3 tutorial series. I've had a bit of a rearrange of my office, uh, so new camera position, new lights, uh, but same synth. And today we're talking about the arpeggiator and sequencer, which in typical pigments fashion is a huge subject. So it's going to take us a couple of episodes. Today we'll deal with the basic stuff, more advanced stuff next time. If you're enjoying this video series and you want a way to support me and my channel, uh, check out the Patreon link below, that's the best way to do it. Okay, onwards. I've chosen a slightly warmer sound for today's demonstration because we're going to be hearing lots of notes and I didn't want the brush um, sawtooth completely unadulterated. And we're going to head over to the sequence tab and we see a big black hole of nothingness. And achievement unlocked if you can find the power button. It's about there. Bang. Nailed it. Okay, so we've now got an arpeggiator and sequencer. The difference between the two is that an arpeggiator is all about you playing a chord on the keyboard and then pigments breaking that chord up into multiple notes and playing them uh, in a structured fashion as opposed to a sequencer where you specifically key in individual um, note offsets and then whatever note you play, single note you play on the keyboard um, generates a sequence according to those um, programmed notes. And we're going to get onto sequences later. Let's start with arpeggiators first. So what I'm going to do is play a, a C major chord. And it's now playing C, E, G, C, E, G over and over again. The reason it's playing that over and over again is because we're in up mode. Switch to down mode and now it'll play G, E, C. And then we have two up and down modes, inclusive and exclusive. Inclusive means it plays the extreme notes twice. So it'll play C, E, G, G, E, C, C, E, G, G. So each sequence up and down is played in its entirety every time. So you hear those double notes at the top and bottom as opposed to exclusive, where it only plays the extreme notes once. Uh, as played, uh, literally um, maps to the, the order in which you play them. So if I play uh, C, G, E, it plays the chord in that manner. If I now add a B, out of chromatic order and finally the pretty obvious random mode just literally chooses a, a different way to play them each time okay so that's the absolute basics of what an arpeggiator is just switch it back to up mode so what's all this stuff over here these are called tracks so at the moment what we're actually doing is we're examining the arpeggiator track and we've just dealt with the mode function now you can see we've got a div column here. What this basically does is it makes the arpeggiator play each note in the sequence this many times. So if I play a C major chord in up mode, you're going to get C, C, E, E, G, G. I want to jump down to the gate length next. I think that's the next easiest to explain. And we're going to ignore the random column for today. That's uh, one for next time. Let's have a look at what these boxes do over here, these blue boxes. The currently highlighted one is the segment that's being played. So these are like slices of the entire track. So we've got eight divisions of time over which this arpeggiator is going to do something but every one of these tracks is actually completely independent. They don't all have to run at the same time. You see, when I play a chord, they're all moving on at the same speed, but they don't have to. What I'm gonna do is slow the gate length track down uh, by half. So it's now going to move half the speed of all of the other segments. And you can see it falling behind. And after two full iterations, the gate length track has completed um, one, one run. Each highlighted segment within that track 
allows us to change what that particular attribute of the arpeggiator does. Now, gate length is all about the length of the note. So by default, it's set to 50%, which means 50% of the time when this note is being like basically like virtually held down or played, you're hearing a sound. If I set it to 100%, in a few very short steps, we've got something that's reasonably complex here. We're playing every note twice, the gate length is moving half the speed of all of the other tracks. And now I've just said that when playing this segment here, play the notes for twice as long. So what you're going to get when I press this chord down is long C, long C, short E, short E, short G, short G, and carry on. And it'll play all of these other segments with a 50% gate length. You'll hear the notes and then you'll hear silence. And every time it gets round to this segment, it'll play the full note. So you get two long notes for each iteration of the gate length. Now if we start messing with this thing, so we're going to make some really short notes. Make those two really short, so they're going to be very staccato. We'll have a longer one there and then maybe a short one. We're going to start generating a more interesting arpeggio. Let's get the arpeggiator back to single tone. So we're just playing C E G C E G. But you can see the gate length is still hanging around twice the length of time of all of the other segments. Let's introduce another track. Let's do Slide next. Now what Slide does is basically generates a little mini um, portamento effect or slew from one note to another. So at 100%, it's going to take the entire length of time that it's spent in its segment, getting from the previous note to the next note. Now if those two notes are the same, if you're playing two instances of C, for instance, there would be no slide. But of course, now that I've switched the arpeggiator mode to standard up, then every note is different from the previous one. So in order to accentuate these slides, I'm going to make it slide on the gate length 100% segment. So we'll have a bit of slide over here. And let's have some on this first segment as well. I'm going to bring gate length back in sync so that these two long notes have an opportunity to breathe. Something that's worth mentioning at this point, because it can be really confusing, I'm playing a three note chord and we have an eight note arpeggio here. So the entire thing is constantly wrapping around on itself. You're not getting consistent visual results. You're not gonna hear the same thing by looking at this eight bar sequence because it's constantly repeating. But you can really hear, clearly hear those slides. Now, having said it's confusing because we've got an eight note pattern here, we don't have to. Let's make it nine. So we're now always going to get a C in segment one and an E in segment two and so on. You hear that first note, it's sliding down from the previously high G. Listen to gate one, the segment one. It's sliding from G down to C each time. There's an absolutely tropical storm outside. Sorry if you can hear the rain. Okay, let's uh, start messing with some of that stuff. If we set different offsets for each of those, then all hell's going to break loose. Let's keep going. What have we got in the octave? section well we can go up two octaves or down two octaves so let's have a plus one and a minus one let's go crazy i'm going to set gate length and slide back to zero or we won't be able to track what's going on so now any notes caught in one of the segments that's not at zero is going to be transposed by that many octaves Obviously, we can make it hang around 
for as long as we like. So now the octave offsets that are being set by that track are hanging around for effectively four notes, four notes of the arpeggio. Because I'm counting in fours and the, the arpeggio is playing three note chords. The madness doesn't stop there. Trigger probability allows us to specify the odds of the note actually playing at all. So if we bring this down from 100%, which means you're guaranteed to hear it, now sometimes you won't hear the notes. So it's, it's a, a pure probability. We don't know whether or not we're going to hear the notes or not. Everything so far has been in eighths, but of course they don't need to be. And in the sync options, we can set triplets and dotted and, and also obviously, as you can see, uh, a, a specified BPM, we can run whatever we want. That's pretty cool. Let's jump over to sequencer and see what we can do over there. So you can see it's retained when I've switched over to the sequencer, it's retained all of the, the fundamental rhythmic information that I've just imported. Basically got kind of a rhythmic template here, but now it's not going to play that arpeggio. If I just play a C on the keyboard, Everything that you're hearing there is a variant of the note C. And the only reason you're hearing different uh, flavors of C is because our octave offsets are still set. But of course, we can now plug in whatever pattern we want. Let's have a C major seven thing, but then we'll add we'll either nine in there. That sounds good. Oh, something just happened by accident there. I've not actually shown. You've basically got like a pencil drawing ability on any of these tracks. So I'm clicking and dragging and I can set multiple controls uh, all, in one, all in one go. Okay, so I'm just gonna play the note C. Slow it down a bit. I'm going to reset the trigger probability so I can just press the refresh button and it resets all the segments to 100%. So I'm hearing all the notes now. Now what I want to do is trim 10% off all of these probabilities all at one go. I can do that if I press the shift key and then select any one of the um, steps. I've been calling them segments of nice steps and start dragging, you can see all of the others coming down and it's a relative change. So I'm going to bring step one back up to 100% and then again shift and drag and you can see them all moving up and down. Now this isn't great. If you don't actually exactly land on the current position, let's say I click down here, it picks it up and then starts moving it relatively. Um, that's not particularly intuitive to me. So what I'm going to do is set them all just to, let's say 90%. Now we're going to get an occasional dropout. Now we're not going to worry about this scale feature for now. That's another one for next episode. We have a transpose key. So if I press a C on the keyboard, and disable all of my slides so that we can really hear all of these notes. So every time I press a key, that's a C. I transpose up by one semitone. Now you're hearing a C sharp, pretty obvious. And finally for today, uh, velocity. 
Now, ignore the as played bit for the moment. Let's just pretend that it's not there. What this is basically going to do is control the volume of the played notes according to the MIDI values that we set, 0 to 127. Just need to head over to our amp mod to give me some um, velocity sensitivity on the keys so that we can hear this stuff. So really soft key, loud key, and now bringing the sequencer back in. So some of those notes are played louder than others. If I set as played to zero, it means that these notes are going to be played at exactly this volume. So I'll make some of them really, really quiet. So every time it goes around, this set, uh, step here is being played at exactly 35. If I set velocity to 100%, it's going to ignore this curve and it's going to play exactly however hard I play on the keyboard. So really soft. You can hardly hear it. And there's loud. And then we basically just get to morph. So by default, it starts off at 25%, but if you double click, it actually goes to zero. So 25 is just adding a little bit of variance from the keys, but primarily taking its velocity information uh, from the track. In the next episode, we'll have a look at some of the more advanced features, including the potentially brain-melting polyrhythm. We'll deal with all of that next time. Thanks very much for watching. Hope to see you then.